Why the populist dialogues? Populism was a product of an economic system which drove the American people into either greater wealth or abject poverty. From 1873 until 1893, America experienced a devastating economic crisis characterized by falling farm prices and massive urban unemployment. The two parties were entrenched with the railroads and the banks. A third party was needed that united black, white, and red, as well as urban factory workers with rural farmers. Thus the People's Party, known as the Populists, were born. Our program is called the Populist Dialogues because we identified with these early populists, the principal cause of today's economic, social, environmental, and political problems is the corporate takeover of our democracy. Corporate dominance has eliminated most of our democratic institutions. Most importantly, the American people's active participation in our decision-making processes. Our program's purpose is to inform our audience of the current populist solutions to these problems. We promote true populist ideas and ideals, unlike phony populists who identify government as the source of their oppression and use wedge issues to divide the poor, working class, and the middle class. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I host this series of half-hour weekly cable like, access programs produced here at the studios of Portland Community Media in Portland, Oregon. Today our guest is Nancy Mattella. Nancy Mattella is a member of the Alliance for Democracy. She's a citizen activist. She's worked on election integrity issues in the past. She is also working on water issues, specifically the, the right to water. Uh, with the Alliance for Democracy. She's also worked on a related issue with regard to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. So uh, welcome to the program, Nancy. Thank you, David. Great, good, good to, good to have you here. I actually, we should have had you here long ago, but uh, time marches on rather quickly. Mm. So, uh, so welcome Thank to the you. show. So uh, before we get on to the main focus of why you're here about the water, tell us a little bit about what you did about election integrity. Mm. Uh, I had started working on water issues uh, in the early 2000s, but uh, when the 2004 election happened, uh, there were a number of us that were pretty upset about uh, the results and felt like uh, there was maybe some hanky-panky going on nationwide uh, with those elections. And we pretty quickly realized when we investigated it that we could only influence Oregon, we couldn't influence the nation. And so we had a group called the Oregon Voter Rights Coalition and uh, worked with a lot of different people, including state legislators, to see what we could do to institute something that would help safeguard our election, um, our vote counting system. Even though we're, we are a mail-in ballot system, uh, those ballots are still fed through computers and all of us know that computers can be hacked. So uh, through our work, um, 18 months later, we had legislation passed that um, basically uh, requires an audit be done. Uh, a certain number of votes are pulled from each um, county uh, in the state and verified that the computer counted it as it was marked. So that was a little detour from my water oh. issues, but it that was, was very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just shows what a few dedicated citizens can do if right. they put their mind to it. Yeah, and actually that was why I wanted you to talk about that because it is, it is a case where because you and others banded together, you were able to actually um, affect what public policy is. Absolutely. And create a system that we can actually have some trust in. So Absolutely. Right. We kind of surprised ourselves even. Uh -huh. It was a lot of hard work, but um, spread out over about a dozen and a half people. Um, all, you know, uh -huh. all told, we did make a difference. Okay, so. great, good, yeah. And you've been making a difference on uh, the question about Hanford also. Uh, well, I'm certainly banging the drums about it. <laughs> yes, Whether um, there's a difference, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I kind of uh, um, scare people a lot in telling them what's going on, so that they will get to the 
to the hearings mm -hmm. and and be heard and sometimes we will cut the presenters off as they are trying to lead us down a path saying you know all is good here and we're saying wait a minute it's leaking into the Columbia River that is not good tell mm -hmm. us about that right. we don't want to hear about cleaning up this remote building we want to hear about the Columbia River and the groundwater so I have been doing a little bit of mm -hmm. beating the drum right, around yes. that. in fact uh, I was tabling at the Mississippi Street Fair uh, a couple weeks ago and mm -hmm. Mayor Adams came by the booth and said hello and, and specifically said that he appreciated the work that uh, the Alliance for Democracy, primarily through you, has been doing to alert the city of Portland and keep them abreast of what's happening mm. at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. So uh, kudos to you. Oh, thank you, and right. kudos to Mayor Adams. He actually showed up first time a city official, county, or state official showed up at a hearing and said, this is ridiculous. Clean this place up and do not bring on any more nuclear waste until it is cleaned up. Mm -hmm. It was just terrific that he, he actually left a budget meeting to come for that 15 minutes to mm -hmm. be heard. Right. So great. it's been great. Good, great, yeah. So what we want to talk about today is about water and specifically about the potential for it to be privatized, focusing on Oregon. So one of the well, let's just talk about first, what does privatization of water mean? Basically, privatization is uh, selling something for a profit. And uh, in the case of uh, our timber, uh, our timber, a natural resource, was sold uh, for a profit by um, private companies, meaning stockholder interests come before the public interest. In the case of water, which is a natural resource just like our trees are, um, it is, uh, if it's privatized, then stockholder interests and profits come before consumers. In the case of wood and, and tree products, uh, there are alternatives to building. If they wipe out all our trees, they can build things with other things, concrete, stone, etc. If you wipe out water or you pollute our water or it's, it's oversold, there is no substitute. Water is second only to air in terms of life, not only for humans, but all living things on this planet. So I, I, I would assume from that that you would agree with the statement that water is a human right? Absolutely. It's not a commodity to be mm -hmm. bought and sold for profit. Right. Okay. But there are attempts in Oregon now to privatize our water. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the, the state of Oregon actually has some of the lowest percent of um, privatization of around the nation with the state of Washington having uh, one of the higher percentages and that is um, where utilities actually are run by private companies. Uh, we just have a few small utilities in Oregon that are run by private companies. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, you say, when you say utilities, you're talking about water utilities because yes, uh, obviously you. our electricity mm -hmm. in Oregon is Certainly. mostly private as opposed right. to Washington, which is mostly public. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So Good. water is mostly public, but there are a few that are, um, if not owned uh, by public com private companies for profit, they're, at le they're operated. Um, for instance, um, uh, let's see, uh, Wilsonville has just recently contracted with CH2M Hill to uh, run the Wilsonville uh, water plant. So uh, CH2M Hill is a private company. That means that they have to pay their stockholders money, called profit, mm -hmm. return on their investment before, that's what corporations do. They're number one obligated to owners and that comes before they pay money to um, or give benefits to customers. So that adds a burden to the whole rate schedule. And uh, with Wilsonville going to a private company, um, it's kind of one of the big utilities in the state that is uh, now being managed okay. privately. And I, I thought the Wilsonville uh, water plant was was it built by Veolia or, or was it managed by Veolia and now they're turning it over to CH2M Hill? Um, right. Um, the sewer is being operated by, excuse me, 
I'm reversing them. Thank you, David. Okay. Uh, I'm reversing them. Uh, right. The water system is Veolia. The sewer system okay. is CH2M Hill. Oh, okay. I uh, I think of sewer as um, as the, the brother of our clean water system it because mm -hmm. it's all part of the big cycle. So thank you for correcting um, okay. me. Yes, Wilsonville's um, uh, treatment plant uh, for water is Veolia, and this is about seven or eight years old because their uh, well system uh, started becoming contaminated and the, uh, the state said no more wells to be built or dug, um, which meant no more development um, because of the increased contamination as water tables drop down, arsenic and those things come up mm -hmm. and increases the concentration. So they chose, rather than hooking into the city of Portland water from Bull Run, they chose to drink from the Willamette, and that's when Viole was brought in. That sounds so disgusting. Well, it's not only their <laughs> water, but Dasani bottled water, mm -hmm. which is bottled by Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is one of the largest uh, ratepayers for Wilsonville, and people who drink Dasani bottled water are drinking Willamette water. Oh, and so the Wilsonville plant supposedly cleans it, uh, and mm -hmm. then sells it to Coca-Cola, uh, who, who bottles it. Yes, uh, I see. and sell okay. it as Dasani. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, so, so little by little, so, uh, things like that are creeping in. Um, those are the obvious privatization issues um, that come up where uh, water utility is uh, uh, quite often designed and built by a private company because it can't expect um, a municipality like even like Portland, a large one, to have that expertise on on staff. Um, but to manage um, the operation, uh, usually it is uh, public um, employees. Mm -hmm. And in these cases, uh, we have Gresham, we have Vancouver across the river, we have Wilsonville, both their drinking and their sewer now gone to private uh, companies. So they're mm. scooping profit off uh -huh. the top. Oh, okay. So that's one obvious way of mm -hmm. privatization. Another privatization issue that people don't think about is bottled water. And then we've already talked a little bit about Dasani, but um, very big issue coming up in mm -hmm. the gorge or has been around for a couple of years, but the big decision will be coming in the next year. Bottled water is basically privatization of water. It is taking what we own, the, 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 the uh, state of Oregon citizens own the water. The infrastructure is what we pay for to deliver the water to us, but we own that water mm -hmm. and it is delved or it is divvied up by water rights that the state manages. But um, as soon as someone comes in like Nestle or like Coca-Cola or like Walmart, Walmart has a little artesian well out near Cove, Oregon. Oh, really? And they, oh. they hmm. bottle that water. So that's taking our water that mm -hmm. belongs to the state of Oregon citizens, putting it in bottles and shipping it who knows where probably West Coast, mm -hmm. but might be elsewhere, and for a huge amount of profit, huge amount. They get that water for like two tenths, excuse me, two one hundredths of a cent per gallon, and they turn around and sell it for approximately eight dollars a gallon. Yeah, so a, a, little, a little bottle goes for a buck? Exactly. Right, okay. Right. And that's probably a quarter of a gallon, less than a quarter of a gallon, maybe an eighth of a gallon. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay. All right, so that that's so that's where it comes up. And so people, and of course, you know, Haiti's earthquake, uh, Fukushima, tsunami, those kinds of disasters, of course, bottled water is needed. So we're not saying no bottled water. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is the more we sell people bottled water and and indicate through marketing that it is better for us, then the less people are inclined to pay public rates to keep the public source mm -hmm. clean and good working order, good customer service at a low price. The more you privatize or buy something outside of the public system, the public system is going to 
fall apart. Right. Yeah, it just deteriorates. And there's no support for it. Right. Uh, and, and and as people identify something as belonging in the private sector, then the support for having public diminishes. Correct. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about what Nestle is, is doing in, in Oregon okay. and Cascade Locks. Cascade Locks um, has just uh, on its um, the, the edge of the little city, the city a town has less than a thousand people there. There is a little creek, um, Herman Creek, and um, it is a, a spring water that comes out of the side of the mountain. It's not part of the Bull Run um, system, but it is uh, on the side of uh, Mount Hood. And that water is captured for uh, a, fish, a fish hatchery up there. So mm -hmm. the, the state uses it um, to raise uh, uh, fingerlings. Well, Nestle's researchers, lawyers, who knows, whatever, discovered this little spring. Mm -hmm. And they need a source in the Northwest uh, to have for their spring water so they can sell it. Uh, as Arrowhead, I believe, um, they have something like 60 different brands, so who knows? It uh, could be, uh, they could call it Calistoga water, you know, mm -hmm. for marketing. Uh, five other, one, two, three, four other small towns in the Northwest have turned them down. But Cascade Locks is uh, a timber town that never recovered when um, their mill, their nearby mill was shut down, and um, they have very high unemployment. They have some of the highest in Oregon, which is some of the highest in the nation, which means some of the highest in the nation in Cascade Locks. And this large corporation came along and said, hey, we'll give you 49 jobs. Just sell us your spring water. Mm -hmm. Well, the state's using it for the fingerlings. So the lawyers got together and figured out how to trade municipal groundwater for this spring water do a water right exchange, and then the city of Cascade Locks could sell it to, to Nestle, and that would imp uh, increase their, their revenues for the city, about 250,000 a year, 49 jobs, never mind that it's forklift drivers and, and so forth at uh, probably minimum wage. And so uh, right now, the state of Oregon, uh, the Water Resource Department, is trying to decide whether to allow this exchange. Mm -hmm. There have been over 4,000 letters from uh, Oregonians uh, urging the state not to approve this, not to approve it. Mm -hmm. Cascade Locks, for the most part, support it. It's very hard to come in with a noble idea of water should be for everybody. If you don't have food on your table and you mm -hmm. haven't had a paycheck mm -hmm. for years, mm -hmm. it's very hard. But, yeah. but we're trying to hold the light of the long range idea that water should be for all, mm -hmm. it should not be bottled and sold for someone who can afford a dollar for that bottle. Right, yeah. And I, I know when this proposal originally was made that most of the elected officials at Cascade Lock were. Uh, supportive of, the, of mm -hmm. the idea, but they ha there was election, and I understand that some of those folks left, yes, or, or were voted they off did. the council. And so, uh, how how is that breaking down now in terms of the, the, the new ones support? are uh, f uh, somewhat neutral, but though we don't have anybody who is speaking against it, mm -hmm. um, it's okay. a tough decision for them. Okay. I I appreciate that they're between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and is there any guarantee that these forty nine jobs? Would actually go to residents in Cascade Locks? No, it's open um, and uh, not enrollment. But uh, anybody from nearby Hood River or even Portland could apply for these jobs. Okay, all right. So, so I, I would assume that the residents there are assuming that they're going to get hired, but that's not necessarily the case. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. right. Uh, and er earlier we were talking about um, private companies bottling water. Would it make any difference if if the city of Portland, for instance, started bottling water for sale? Would it make any difference to me? Oh uh, yes, uh, yeah, or, or as, a, as a public policy. Would that be something we would want to oppose also? Uh, uh, certainly, absolutely. Okay. In fact, um, there is a quote, and I'll read it quickly. 
Um, basically, U.S. District Judge Malcolm Marsh, who has presided over Columbia River salmon disputes for years, warned at a recent Portland conference, this would have been two years ago, of uh, fisheries leaders, um, the conference was of fisheries leaders, that other states might want to come after the Columbia as global warming shrinks their water supplies. Quote, I don't think those ideas have died. I think they're very, very much alive, just in sleep mode. He warned Northwesterners to settle our differences over fish and water, and this could be bottled water too, you know, mm -hmm. fill in the blank, whatever uh, the difference is. Uh, settle it now because you don't want people like Californians coming here in a situation of chaos. You want them to come up here in a situation of agreement. And apropos to that, um, until recently, Oregon was one of two states without a comprehensive water plan. So there was no guiding light as to how to, to divvy up water rights and who does get it and who doesn't get it like California okay. coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, uh, that's going to be rectified. There is a comprehensive water plan draft coming out this fall. Okay. And that perhaps will address that. Um, OK, so let's say, you know, let's make a few dollars here and there to balance the city budget or the state budget with our abundant water. Where does it stop? Mm -hmm. The difference between bottled water and wholesale water is bottled water is considered a product. Once the water goes into a bottle, it's under FDA, Food and Drug Administration. Okay. It's no longer EPA regulated. And so people tell me, lawyers tell me, so it's not possible that California could come up here and take our water wholesale because the law says can't do that, can't move it out of um, the watershed. You can change laws, number one. Number two is what's to prevent a big bladder being produced, mm -hmm. putting a whole bunch of water in there, trucking it or barging it down to California. Oh, okay. So. so that would, in spite of the fact that I th I, I'm not sure where it is, but Oregon has some prohibition about exporting water out of the state. Yes. And is that in the Constitution or is that is a law? Or it's a law. It's a mm -hmm. law, so that, that it's could not certainly to be, be changed. Exactly. Uh, you know, and the legislature is increasingly under the influence of big money. Exactly. Uh, and we have no way currently in the current law uh, in Oregon to, to limit that. That's right. Uh, so we could certainly see that kind of thing uh, yeah. change. Like the fellow, um, the state legislator down in southern Oregon who said, hey, it's a resource we have an abundance of. Why don't we change the law? which the legislature can do, uh, okay. let's uh, let's sell some of this excess water. Of course, he's in southern Oregon, which is a little on the dry side, so he's a looking at the water up here. Uh, right. <laughs> right, oh, yeah. right, okay. So. Yeah, so if it was in his backyard, maybe he would feel a little differently about mm -hmm. it, perhaps. Uh, yeah. Perhaps not, though. Right. Right, right. yeah. So, uh, currently, So this whole idea about the bladder, <laughs> this is an intriguing idea, and mm -hmm. I know that this has been proposed in California at one time, right. and they were going to take it within state from, I think, from Northern California and transport mm -hmm. it down to Southern Oregon, or right. uh, Southern California. Right. And that never happened, I don't think. Not that I know of. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, and I was going to ask if you knew why it didn't happen. I, I assume it was probably well, I, I don't know. It could have been some environmental regulations. Yeah. It could have been that it just wasn't economically feasible to do it. Well, I, I honestly don't know. Um, they are pushing very hard to uh, go to desalinization and have something like eight desalinization plants on the uh, drawing board at $1 billion per plant. In California. In California. So I don't know. I mean, bladders. Uh, transporting those very expensive, but uh -huh. certainly so it, it could it could stack up favorably. Um, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Okay. And, and does um, other than this one law, are there are there other regulations in Oregon that slow uh, privatization? Uh, of water, uh, land, look, for instance, land use laws. Are, are, could land use laws be used to either slow or prevent privatization? 
Um, I'm not that familiar with land use laws. Um, in the state of Oregon, um, we run with uh, Western law, which means uh, um, that water rights run with the land. So if a private owner, like Walmart, owns a piece of property and has an artesian well on it, as long as it doesn't run on to somebody else's property, they own the ability to use that water the way they want to. Mm. So, okay, so yeah. that, that's uh, kind of ominous. Very <laughs> ominous. Yeah, great, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So what, uh, what, are the, what, are the, what are the main dangers of, of water privatization? Main dangers. Well, uh, just real quickly, uh, Food and Water Watch is an excellent source to go to for those uh, listening. It's uh, foodandwaterwatch.org, and if you click on their water section and under reports, you can find just an amazing number of things that describe uh, what the dangers of privatization are. Um, some of the things that they've documented well is, for sure, if your utility goes private, you can be a assured of rate increases and um, water quality suffering that has been documented over and over again. Basically the reason the Alliance for Democracy and those of us who believe that uh, water is uh, a democratic right for all living things, not just humans, um, is uh, just that, that um, we need to preserve it and conserve it. Think about letting your uh, lawns go brown in the summertime uh, for all living things. Mm -hmm. It is a closed system, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't seem like it. Okay, great, yeah. And the, other, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is there's, there's a new website about water in Oregon. Can you, yes. Can you describe that for us? Um, yes, this one's actually connected to a national site, but uh, defend <laughs> Help me, David. <laughs> uh, defending Water for Life. Defending Water for Life slash Oregon. It's a new site that David put up and uh, we are contributing to in terms of articles. And it does include Hanford because uh, even though Hanford seems like a separate issue, it uh, is uh, jeopardizing the Columbia River. And the Columbia River is second largest in the United States and is certainly uh, the lifeblood of the Northwest. So. Great. Good. Thank you very much for joining Thank us Thank you, today. David. Great. It's good to have you here, and we'll have you back. That would be wonderful. Great. Good. Yeah, so in closing, of course, I want to thank our crew. Uh, before I do that, we, I, I do want to correct the, the website that we just said, the actual uh, address for the Defending Water for Life Oregon website is defendingwater.net backslash Oregon, so, uh, and okay. I don't have a link on that to our website yet, but I will have one in the oh. next few days. Okay. Um, uh, the, the other, the other uh, uh, website I want to call people's attention to is the move to amend, which is amending the Constitution to eliminate corporate personhood. We have a new website here in, for the Portland group, and that website is move to amend pdx.org and I invite you to go there, <coughs> learn a little bit more about what we're doing here in Portland and how you can be involved. So with that, we'll, we'll close. I do want to thank our crew today, uh, Janet Morris, Virginia Hammond, Roger Bates, Tom Thomas, Hollis Benedict, and Joan Horton. They give up their time voluntarily to be down here at the studios at Portland Community Media uh, and record us. And uh, so we're on the air providing this information to you. And with that, I think that uh, we are finished for today. And I hope that you will join us again next week. Thank you. <laughs>